All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Brooke Krieger. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of Minnesota. And today I'm going to be talking to you about religious liminality, hybridized ritual formation in post-Roman Britain, um, which anyone who's ever studied religion knows how difficult it is to study religion. Um, and it's a lot of fun. This is an image of Canterbury. This is St. Augustine's um, uh, site, um, uh, his cathedral, and it's beautiful. Um, and I put it up because Canterbury has the only um, fairly firm evidence for pre-Augustine Christian practice from the 5th and 6th centuries, um, which is the Church of St. Martin's. Um, and it's as firm as we get, uh, which you'll find out. So, um, hybridization occurs during periods of change when culture is reforming in response to stimuli, either internal or external. Within these hybridizing events, religion is a barometer for the worldview of the culture. When religions hybridize, they indicate that the culture itself is evolving. The hybridization or adaptation indicates that the society is rethinking how its world functions. Sometimes these hybridizations have less impact, such as the inclusion of an additional god to the polytheistic Roman pantheon, or sometimes they indicate larger transitions, such as a conversion from a polytheistic ritual practice to a monotheistic one. The case study of post-Roman Britain with an examination of Christian practice in the migration period allows for the study of how a monotheistic religion evolves within a polytheistic society. The development of hybridization indicates that the integration of one practice into another, while the resistance to hybridity can indicate something entirely different. The interactions between cultures are revealed by the degree of the subsequent hybridity and are important for understanding the changes in the society. So how does hybridization begin? When do cultures consciously or unconsciously begin to integrate the practices and materials of another culture into their own? How can we even begin to understand the processes, processes and the motivations behind it? How do we, as archaeologists, attempt to understand the origins of these changes, such as the material manifestations, since the material manifestations may precede or follow the change in mindset? For ephemeral concepts such as belief, the hybridity of the material and ritual manifestations of the religion are all that can be recovered. Within the hybridizing events, the material culture of religion represents the belief system of the culture. When it changes, it means that the belief system has already changed or is about to do so. While the appropriation of material and the ascription of native beliefs to the foreign items is possible, the new material was still integrated for a purpose, usually to accommodate new members. Beliefs about how the world functions and where their community resides within their understanding of the cosmos is reflected in the tangible rituals and material culture that is produced. When these tangible items change in response to new culture contact, they represent a hybridization of belief, more than the material culture has hybridized. While there are many terms for the process of hybridization, bricolage, coined by Levi Strauss in 1968, liminality and the rites of passage, used by Turner in 1967, and Foucault's heterotopic, heterotopic spaces in the 1960s, the understanding of why cultures change at the time they do has not been well examined. The motivations for change are sometimes simple. Economic concerns, religious persecution, social integration, or more straightforward conquering by another society, which is usually nice and clear. Not always. Um, yet, in archaeological situations where cultures coexist and have done so in the past, what motivates individuals to adapt and hybridize? My case study of post-Roman Britain focuses on the hybridization of Christian practice within the Anglo-Saxon sphere. We know from all the texts that discuss 5th and 6th century Britain, which I'll show you a few clips of, um, that there were Christians in Britain that were practicing the, after Rome withdrew. But where are they? Archaeologically, they, must, they are mostly invisible. Christian practice became hybridized in a way that made them recognizable to other Christians in life, but invisible to the archaeological record in death. Which brings me to wonder the following. How hybridized must the material culture be for the Christian practitioners to be archaeological and archaeologically invisible? Ward Perkins, in 2000, 
asserted that there were definitely Christians within the Anglo-Saxon landscape of Eastern Britain. While it is unknown how Christian the Roman Romano-British landscape was, the historic records make it clear that there were a large group of Christians in the 5th and 6th centuries, which hopefully you've now read. Um, to understand the hybridization, the Christians of the 5th century need to be identified. If there were 5th century Christians, they adapted to Anglo-Saxon dress standards and wore personal ornamentation associated with the Anglo-Saxon belief system. Based upon 15 cemeteries ranging, ranging across East Anglia and Kent, um, encompassing 921 inhumation burials and over 2,000 cremations, there are only a small number of artifacts that could be related to Christianity. It has been well established by Sam Lucy in 2000, Helen Geeky in 2003, and many others that there was a regulated burial tradition among the Anglo-Saxons. A handful of burials have been identified within the cemeteries that were conducted in the traditions of the Roma romano Britons and not Anglo-Saxons, indicating that there were still separate traditions being maintained, at least minimally, within regions traditionally concerned to be, or considered to be dominantly Anglo-Saxon. Identifying the hybridization process of the Romano-British first involves trying to identify a few Christian practitioners to try and understand how this how the hybridization was enacted. The few Christian materials recovered from burials are debatable at best, but that is essentially what we're looking for, items that could be Christian but aren't immediately recognizable as such. The most intriguing burial with evidence for Christian practice is present in the cemetery, oh sorry, these are the sites that will be discussed are Spong Hill and Morningthrope in Norfolk. Um, and these are all the Anglo-Saxon cemeteries as of 2013 that have been excavated and identified. Um, so we've got two out of 224. Um, the most intriguing burial with evidence for Christian practice is present in the cemetery of Morningthorpe in Norfolk. Morningthorpe is mainly a 5th century cemetery with a vital burial for understanding of how Christian materials fit into the post-Roman religious landscape. 365 inhumations and nine cremations were ex excavated from the site, and within those inhumations, one in particular is worth examining. This is grave 384, which is the inf inhumation of an older infant or younger juvenile female, and contains a remarkable number of grave goods, um, indicating that she was incredibly, or her family was incredibly wealthy and she was well valued. Um, but this concerns in particular the silver zoomorphic mount that may have been modified to serve as a pendant and worn as a necklace. Um, and in addition, uh, she was accompanied by materials that were found mainly with adult females, which are used to signify their place in society and their household, including three iron keys and an iron ring likely used to hold items in place on a girdle hanger and an iron knife with a horn ha handle. The evidence for Christianity in grave 384 is found on a late Roman silver finger ring, which is there, um, with a cross incised in the center of the ring's surface, which has been dated to the late 4th or early 5th century, possibly hung from a necklace as well. So she could have had two very different symbols hanging around her neck. Um, the silver Finger Ring's late Roman date indicates that it held an important role in the life of the young girl and her family. This is the only explicit evidence for Christian material at the site, and it's interesting that it comes in a fully outfitted grave of a juvenile female. The ring would have been an heirloom by the time it was deposited and made a, may have held a different meaning other than Christianity. We have to acknowledge that. But it does... This grave does represent the combination of a number of representations, the cross of Christian faith and a zoomorphic pendant that may have represented a version of Woden with horns. The interpretation of this young girl's identity is complicated as she is very young to have such rich grave goods, um, suggesting that she came from an influential family within the community. And the religious interpretation comes from a combination of traditional Anglo-Saxon grave goods and the silver Roman ring with a Christian cross.
This is evidence of a variation of Christian practice within a wider religious landscape where the residual Roman Christianity has been integrated into the polytheistic practices of the Anglo-Saxons, as interpreted with Redwald, Sutton Hoo Mound One burial, um, a few hundred years later. It is also possible that the silver ring is simply an heirloom without a complex religious meaning, although they likely would have been aware of the meaning of a cross. Um, and as such, needs to be considered. The cemetery of Spong Hill possesses a hint of possible Christian practice among its plethora of traditional Anglo-Saxon inhumations and cremations. There are two pieces of questionable Christian iconography found in two separate burials. In inhumation 11, the pendants of a necklace were found featuring the suggestion of a cross. They are very similar to pendants found two centuries later that are considered to have deliberate cross representations, which may suggest that these are an early form of the same. However, they are not dissimilar to the traditional pendants found among the Anglo-Saxon female dress. Even if the materials are made with one intent, it does not discount the possibility that they were favored for their similarity to a Christian cross. Additionally, in Mound 2, I like these, um, a pair of fish emblems meant to be mounted on a shield have been found. Fish are one of the early symbols of Christianity used to indicate covert Christian belief within the Roman Empire. However, a fish can also be a symbol of aggression among the Anglo-Saxons and associated with a, a warrior similar to a bird of prey or a boar. They're supposed to be pike. If anyone's ever seen pike, they're very aggressive fish. Um, they jump at you and everything. The flaw in this possible, these possible Christian items is that they cannot be tied exclusively to Christianity. Yet if Christian rhetoric was active within the British landscape, as the historic texts um, report, the users were likely aware with the associations. These are very clear Christian symbols um, during this time period. Spong Hill also contains one of the few burials that is attributed to a Romano-British individual separate from the Anglo-Saxon burials. The Romano-British inhumation features a female buried in the crouch position, which is unusual among the Anglo-Saxon burial trends. The female skull also exhibits a, a genetic trait, which is uh, an elongation of the back of the skull, which is a feature found among the Romano-British populations of East Anglia. This burial is significant as it demonstrates not only that the deceased may have continued their association with the earlier culture, um, but that also that there were survivors willing to bury her in this tradition. You don't bury yourself, as we all know. The hybridity of Christianity in 5th and 6th century Eastern Britain is represented in the relative invisibility of its practitioners. The scarcity of Christian material and burial does not discount the possibility of Christian practice. While some individuals self-identify or are identified as Christian in the historic records, it does not follow that they abandon all other forms of ritual or belief. The inclusion of Christian stories and ideals into the polytheistic traditions of the Romano-British or Anglo-Saxons would not be surprising. When cultures resist integration and exist separately, there are two possible results, peaceful coexistence or friction between two cultures. The opposing cultures identify one another as the other, which is a powerful and divisive figure within a cultural framework. It is pervasive in every culture since it serves as a uniting figure within the group. As in times of war, the uniting against a common enemy, enemy is an easy way to maintain and reinforce cultural norms. <coughs> Hybridization is the acceptance and integration of cultural practices. It allows for cultures to normalize their differences and become compatible with one another. While they may still identify as separate cultural lineages, since the Anglo-Saxons pla placed a high value on ancestral lines, the cultural differences can be normalized. The speed of hybridization and material invisibility of Christian practice is astounding. Over the course of one generation, the nature of a religion changed. The speed of cultural adaptation brings the concept of organic versus intentional hybridity, which draws in the issue of the strength of the two cultures. The Anglo-Saxons were the dominant culture of Britain, and while the number of Anglo-Saxon migrants is undecided, it's less important when the culture is dominant. Um, and the native culture is a weaker borrower. Um, so that means that the Anglo-Saxon culture was very appealing to the Romano-British. 
The Anglo-Saxon culture was, um, yeah, I just said that. Um, from the later historic records, particularly the laws of Ine, we know that there was a distinct division between the Britons and the Anglo-Saxons, suggesting that even during the early phases of migration and integration, there were advantages to appearing Anglo-Saxon. Um, the value of a, um, of a non-Anglo-Saxon is less in the laws of Ine, if you're not familiar with them. So if you killed one, it didn't cost you as much in reparations. Um, so what does this mean for Christian hybridization? One, we know that a largely Christian land has little trace of Christian practice after the Anglo-Saxon migration began. Two, we know that historically the Christians were recognizable for the 5th and 6th centuries before the official conversion. And three, we know that archaeologically we can't identify the Christian practitioners particularly well. These three key points suggest that Christian practice became highly hybridized, is the only theory thus far that can allow for the, all three aspects of culture to coexist. A further point is that we also know that the Anglo-Saxons were not Christianized until the seventh century, yet there were pilgrimages in East Anglia that are recorded in um, all of the texts, really, uh, starting with the life of St. Germanus all the way through to Bede. Everyone records the site of St. Albans and his martyrdom and that there were pilgrimages, and yet there is no tangible evidence for that um, yet in the area. So we know that people were passing into East Anglia to go to St. Albans um, to see the shrine as pilgrims. Um, so there's active Christianity occurring. This last point suggests that the Christian practitioners were tolerated and allowed to maintain their own shrines. It is important to note that contrary to the historic records, there is no archaeological evidence for a shrine at St. Albans or any pilgrimage practices. They're probably under the modern cathedral. Um, that's what we tell ourselves, at least. The archaeological visibility of religion is found in ritual spaces and burials. The lack of clear, <coughs> interpretable Christian practice when the Romano-British Christian practice of the 4th century is recognizable, and the later conversion period Christianity of the 7th century, and the Christian practices of the Franks and Gaul during the 5th and 6th centuries are all recognizable, suggests that something very different was happening in Britain, the migration period and subsequent integration of different cultures happened very differently within Britain than it did in Gaul. This all suggests that Christians hybridized their beliefs in the afterlife and death and the location of their ritual performances. Burials in Eastern England all appear to conform to the Anglo-Saxon burial styles, um, in the majority. Uh, and within Kent, the Jutes do bury east-west with very few grave goods and look suspiciously Christian, but are not. Um, uh, Britain burials appear to conform to social status rather than religious variances, suggesting that in death, the wealth of life was more important than the regulations of Christian burial. You can also imply that since the Britons were considered separate and lower than the Anglo-Saxons, again referring to the later laws of Ine, that the continuing Christian practitioners would be among the less pro prosperous and as such be buried with very few items. In conclusion, the threshold for hybridity clearly varies based on the stresses within each culture. The higher the stress level and strength of the lending culture, the more quickly the hybridization will occur. The degree of hybridization al also depends on the cultural advantages the integrated culture offers. If a culture's features are advantageous, as with languages and trade systems, then the adapting culture will more readily accept the hybridization. Predictably, I'll conclude that the threshold for hybridization depends on multiple factors. Most importantly, oh, sorry, that's St. Albans. Um, most predictably, um, whether the integration to, is used to avoid violence or has economic and status advantages. Based on the assumptions that the Britons were not all killed and push, pushed the West Coast by the Anglo-Saxons, clearly the cultural pressure on the Britons to integrate into Anglo-Saxon culture allowed for a low thre hybridization threshold, aka a quick hybridization and adaptation to Anglo-Saxon culture. Thank you.